We serve a mighty God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. One more time, God has given us another opportunity where we can go to the Word of God and see the new normal of the New Testament church. When they came together after the day of Pentecost, after the church was born in power, we see change in every way, first by way of lives that gotten changed. And we see how those that were followers of Jesus Christ, their lives were transformed because of the mighty work of the Holy Spirit from within that brought about change that was manifest on the outside. We saw new normals, new ways of worshiping God, new ways of serving God, new ways of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, new hopes that brought new expectations people rose into new levels of faith and saw great things that god would do in that day that they have never seen before we're living in that time that era has continued to our day we're in a time of the holy spirit we're in a time where god has already released the promise of the father given us the holy spirit so that everything that we do in our lives and especially everything that is done from the church the bible says that god built a spiritual house not a house of bricks not a house of glass not a house of man-made materials god built a spiritual house and so therefore every activity that we do it is by way of the spiritual and everything that we use to build what is God's kingdom, what belongs to God, what is the body of Christ, everything that is used to build can only be spiritual materials and not carnal, not human, but spiritual materials. And we see the spiritual activities that was the new normal in the New Testament church, right from the book of Acts chapter 2. And one of those was the breaking of bread coming to the Lord's table, partaking of the Holy Communion. That is most significant. That's very important right from that day because it separated the New Testament believers from all the rest. No matter how religious they were, no matter how pious they were, no matter how long their beards rolled down to the ground, and no matter how many times a day they prayed, but the New Testament believers were separated from them because they were no longer like them. They practice new lifestyles as being new creations of God. The Holy Communion was most important because it celebrated everything that is about Jesus and what He has done for us. That it's no longer salvation by works and no longer about the keeping of the laws, but it's about the grace of God that none qualified except God qualifies us by way of His Son, Jesus Christ, and what He did for us on the cross. The Holy Communion is not a religious ritual. The Holy Communion is not something that you do because of the law. Holy Communion is the commandment of God. It's a commandment of God that is attached to the new covenant. It's a commandment with promise. It's a commandment that also has God's covenant promises that was given to us as the New Testament believers. Let's turn our Bibles again to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we will continue from the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's start with verse 23. This is Paul bringing the word of God to the New Testament church. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. 
just want to point out to you that most important of all, that everything that becomes a part of our lives, that's part of our being, must come through revelation. Paul says, I receive a revelation from God. The church of Jesus Christ is not built on man's ideas or opinions. It is built upon revelation. It is the word of God that's revealed. Revelation is the revealing of things that are mysteries. There has been things that have been hidden from us, but by the Holy Spirit, we get understanding and we come to know them as God's revelation. So partaking of the Holy Communion is not something that you do casually. It's not something that is a part of a way of the church until it becomes so common to us and it becomes an activity that we don't even think about. It must always be fresh revelation every time we partake of the Holy Communion because there is covenant promises in there that God wants to give to us if we will reach out in faith to believe on what we have received by revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 continues in the next verse. It says in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when Jesus had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant or the new testament in my blood. Do this, you do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Very important. We've taken some time to talk about proclaiming. Don't stop proclaiming. You continue to declare and proclaim what the death of Jesus Christ meant. The power of the cross that Jesus died upon. You proclaim the plan of God for the salvation of mankind. You proclaim that Jesus didn't come just so that our sins might be forgiven when he was nailed on the cross and died, but that he also redeemed our human person, that we will have God in our lives from then on, that our life here on earth will once more be connected to the divine destiny and purpose that God has for us to be here on earth that we will not only serve God in our lifetime, but we will finish our assignment on earth before we go back to the Father. That He redeemed us so that we can be free from everything that sin brought to our lives, the bondages and all the things that have caused us to, be, us to be oppressed and bound, those things that the devil put on us and make us victims of his and keep us captives. Jesus came to set captives free. That the work of the cross that we proclaim, it is about the stripes of Jesus, that by those stripes we were healed. That when Jesus died on the cross, he bought full redemption. It was full, it was not half, it was not even almost full, it was totally full. That spirit, soul and body Jesus brought the new into every life that comes into the kingdom of God. We must remember what it means when Jesus died on the cross and proclaimed that. We proclaim it because today our voices can be so easily drowned because we speak so softly if we even speak at all. But we hear many voices around us, the voices of our circumstances, the voices from our doctors, the voices from what 
our business tells us, from what our finances tells us, from what our children tells us, from what our parents tells us, from what our neighbors tells us, from what even our church brothers and sisters tells us. There is so much of negative things that are out there. There's so much of bad news everywhere, every turn that we take. It's so humanistic. It's so dependent on the flesh, and the flesh is weak. The human power is so limited. And against the power of God, we're flawed. And yet those voices surround us every day, everywhere we go. And so that's why it's good to come to the Lord's table. And when we do it, it we do it with revelation. That our part when we come to the Lord's table is not to eat just to eat the bread and drink of the cup, but it is a proclamation. It is standing there to proclaim, no, God's word will always stand true. He is truth. And God's word will always prevail. For truth will always prevail. And God will do what he says he will do. Every promise of man can be broken. But the promise of God, he shall keep. He's a covenant-keeping God. We keep proclaiming. We never stop proclaiming of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We proclaim. It is so important for us to proclaim the work that Jesus did on the cross is so powerful. If it's not just life-changing. It changes the earth. It brought mankind into a totally different direction. The covenant. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the covenant. This covenant, this covenant that holds all the promises of God to the redeemed of God. I want you to turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, starting from verse 13. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a cross. Verse 14, That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This is what Peter preached when he spoke about the promise of the Father that's now given not just to the Jews, but to every tongue, to every kindred, to every tribe, to all the peoples of the world throughout every generation. Because Jesus has paid in full and brought about a new covenant that the prophet Jeremiah spoke so well about. But we start here to see a few things that I believe is going to bless you. Here it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not anybody, but Christ. There is not another way. Jesus alone. He brought us eternal life. He brought us salvation. He brought us back to the Father, reconciled us back to Him, that we might become the children of God. It says in verse 27, all the way down to 29, let's look at 20, uh, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither born nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Every wall that divides us, every difference that separates us, all of them have been broken, been brought down and come to naught because Jesus did it all for mankind. He says in verse 29, and if you be Christ or belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, praise God. Here it goes all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Genesis. 
just as it says in verse 14, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So here, he says, first, we belong to Christ. That you Christ. And if you become the child of God and you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. You are descendants of Abraham. And if this be so, then you're not slaves, you're not servants. You are children, you're heirs. You inherit, you have a part in the inheritance. You have a part in what God has promised Abraham. So the new covenant, the covenant of God, brings us, us all the way back to what we couldn't have after we've sinned against God. What we have lost. Jesus brought it back to us. And He takes us all the way back to become heirs of that covenant that God made with Abraham. So, so to, as a child of God, to understand what is in there, what are the parts of that covenant, it's going to be very important because until we know, He says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Until we know, until we have knowledge, and that knowledge is revelation. Until we receive what is revealed of the truth, then we are ignorant of it. We'll never be able to participate in it. But once we have that revelation, then we can have the correct expectations. Then we are able to pray according to the will of God. Then our faith rests not in imaginations. Our faith does not rest in the lies that the devil tried to sell us. Our faith then does not lie in the words of man, but our faith lies in the unchanging word of God. So let's take a look now, going back to Genesis chapter 22. There are a few places, as you all know well, that God spoke about His covenant and gave those promises to Abraham. But let's look at Genesis chapter 22 because it is something that shifted, that changed from all the promises of God. It shifted for good in this chapter of Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22, here is where we draw from these verses that will help us today in the circumstances that we are in, the times that we are living in with all the difficulties that we get challenged in so many different ways, how does God bring that truth that will speak to us? In verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and get you into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. I want to pause here to say that we're all in the same place. I think we all feel like God's been testing us, and He's still testing us. We're going through a time where we can feel the tests and the strength of the test. I'll tell you that um, the most meaningful of any test that comes our way is when it is hard, when it takes a lot of from us to respond to those trying times. We go through those times now where we know that it's a real test. It's to see what we don't have. God is dealing with every one of our lives. He's doing something so that we can become better, not worse. So that we will grow so that we will come into the next promotion. God wants to promote you. 
but as everything that man would try to learn from God's ways is to always put a test before the next promotion, that you've got to pass the test, that you've got to be able to go through and see what you've made of. And in that test, it is for you to work out and do everything that you need to do to win the battle, to come up with the best results. We're going through those times. And it's a time that, yes, it may be hard for the flesh, but I will tell you that in there lies our next promotion. Abraham has been tested by God many times, but this is a fierce one. This is a big one. And it almost seemed like for everyone is the same, that every test seems to be the mother of all tests. Every test seems to be more difficult than the ones before. But it's true. Why? Because we're no longer children. We're no longer where we were before. We're now come up as every test has brought a promotion. We're now up there. And what's the point of testing you through something that you've done and you've been through before? And it just takes a little bit of you. But God will always bring us through growing pains because every time a test comes, the next one will always be more stretching than the one before. We're going through those times in our nation. We're going through those times that what's happening around us will affect us. But you see, we're being proved of what we're made of. Are we like those that know not God, that is without God, are we? Or are we those that know that God is with us? And so, God said to Abraham, now take your son, the only son you've got, and I want you to go up now to Mount Moriah, and there I'll tell you where to stop, and I want you to offer your son to me. Now, Abraham had got, he's got everything. God has blessed him. He's blessed him with much. God's not looking for another lamb from Abraham. He can give him a thousand. God is not looking for just another member of the family or just another son. He's looking for his only begotten son, the son that had everything to do with him and came from him, not just anyone. I know that you can relate that to Father God sending Jesus Christ here on earth as He came, His only begotten Son, to be nailed on the cross and died for us. But here God is speaking to us about what is required when God put us through the trials. That it almost, almost seemed each time that He demands a death, that he demands an end to something. He demands a change that is so radical that it's 180 degrees turn, that it's almost like you walk away from something that is familiar, that's part of your life. And God pulls the plug and takes it out of your life. It's a big thing. God said to Abraham, this is what I want. I, just, I don't want just something from your wealth or something that you can give and it can be replaced. I want to take it from you. I ask of you for something that is almost like your own life itself and even maybe even more than your own life. Isn't it strange? It's amazing, isn't it? That every promise of God for mankind, every promise of God that's in this earth, rest in that sacrifice. Because it's about the Isaac that God is going to put his promise upon. And God says, I want you to give him to me. There is some dying that has to take place in our lives. There are things in our lives that we treasure, that we hold dear. And sometimes the struggle continues. The pain is still there because 
we haven't let go. We may have let go some, but we haven't let go completely. And God speaks to some of you this morning, whoever you are, that the pain will stop, the struggle will cease. If you will just let it all go, if you know that this is what God is requiring of you, don't wait anymore. Surrender it at the altar of God because God has something that's far greater, something that is more powerful, something that is more long-lasting, something that is far greater in many dimensions for you if you only know that God is speaking to you. I do believe that sometimes we hold fast to memories, things that were fallen off and our past achievements, whether it is in your business, whether it is in how high you've been, you've gone and you think that, you know, these are very precious achievements. God says to you, will you be willing to let, to let them go and stop being so frustrated and stop being so anxious about those things? Contracts, deals, things that have come to a halt, things that you can't do anything anymore about it. It just is frozen. Will you let it go? Will you stop being obsessed by it and stop allowing these things to run your life and kill your joy and mess up your emotions until you can't focus on what is in front of you and until you cannot see God in the circumstances of your life at the present time. God is saying to you, lay it at the altar of God and start to take the peace of God into your heart and start to allow the Word of God to bring instructions for you every step of the way from here on and give it up for the peace of God in your heart. Trust God. Change the way you pray. Trust God. God said this to Abraham. Abraham did not argue. He did not question. He did not delay. He right away responded to God and he followed what he says. There is a difference between hearing and listening. You know, there are all kinds of words and at the times when God would speak to you, but God wants you to get the message. God wants to be able to, you to be able to receive what He's trying to tell you and not just hear sounds. He wants you to attend to His words. Abraham did, and that made the difference. Going on, I want to skip a few verses. But let's go from verse 3 all the way down to verse 9. And they came to a place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of God called upon, called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Verse 12 says, And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do you anything to him. For now I know that you honor God, you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Or oh, amazing. He was a close call. And he was just about ready to do it. But yet, God stopped him. God wanted to prove his heart. God wanted to test Abraham what he's made of. And God says, that's enough. Now I know 
that you are willing to pray to pay the price. You're willing to give whatever I ask of you. You see, when you come before the altars of God, when God is testing and proving us, when we respond to God, it's not first about what we can gain, but it's about what we give to Him. Today, sacrifice is a bad word. We always hear people talk about the prosperity of God, the blessings of God, and yes, they are true and they are real, but it doesn't start there. It always starts just as Jesus brought us into the new covenant by way of sacrificing himself. Are we willing to sacrifice? Have we stopped sacrificing? Have we started trading with God, doing business with Him? It becomes such a way of life in our Christian life that we're always bargaining with God or we're always trying to do a business deal with God. God, if I do this, would you do this? God, would you do this first so that I will be able to do that? And we've learned Christianity into such a place where we don't even think when it, we try to bargain with God. We don't even put a second thought to it. We can't stop ourselves because we think about what we can gain. What is the benefit? If I serve God, what's the benefit? If I sign up and I'm ready to give my time and this is what I want to do for the work of God, to be a part of what uh, the need of the church is, if I, if I teach in Sunday school, if I, and, and why people wouldn't do a lot of things that they hear from God or they know that they could do this to serve God. Why, why so few people are doing so much? It's because we always think, what is this for me? What is in it for me? What do I benefit and then when you weigh the price you have to pay, when you weigh the time you have to spend versus at the end, what do you get? You can't even get to the starting point. There is a lot of things that you can do to serve God. There is a lot of things that you do and by your doing it and by your serving, you come to the place where God's favor comes upon you and God blesses you because there's nothing that you give out to God is going to be ever wasted because everything that we put on the ground is like seeds that are sowed that comes with the promise of a harvest. But it doesn't ever begin that way. It always starts with are you ready to give it to God? Are you ready to sacrifice to God? And when we're ready to lay it down at the feet of God, then we'll see what God will do. But our heart is to serve God first. Our heart is to invest in the kingdom of God. Our heart is to give of ourselves and our time. And we put an effort in everything that we do for God. We put our best foot forward. I praise God for the many people that are serving God in this congregation. Praise God for the worship team. Praise God for those that are serving the children. Praise God for the ushers and all the time that you spend coming up to church before anybody else and get the place ready. Praise God for our team, the staff that are serving in the church. Praise God for everybody. Praise God for the pastors and praise God for their heart of giving and ready to serve. But it's an entire congregation. This is your house. This is your family. This is where you belong. And so where you belong is where you give of yourself. And this is where you serve with the plans and the, and the vision that God has for this house. Not something outside of that, not another vision. But what is the vision of this house? You give yourself to it because this is God ordained. This is what God's instructions is. It is His command to us as the congregation of God. And so you come in and put your best forward towards it. And you serve with the sacrifice. It's not what you can gain, but what you can give. And I tell you that 
Isn't this the New Testament believer? Isn't this the new normal? Isn't this how they came together and gave all that they have and had all things in common, their lives first? Oh, praise God that He has given us these instructions because again, it is a commandment that comes with the covenant promises of God. And we show this, God showed it all the way when God used Abraham as a symbol, as the type of what will happen in the New Testament. So when we come to the Lord's table, we remember that this is what Jesus did and his finished work that connect us to become a part of the descendants of Abraham so that everything that God promised Abraham, we have a part in it, we are heirs to it, but that's not where it starts. Where it starts is, are you ready to identify with Christ in his death and then in his resurrection? Are you ready to go through the trials as Jesus did? And so also did Father Abraham, the father of faith. I want you to continue to follow with me these scriptures. Chapter 22, I wanted you to now look at verse 6 and 8. I want to now tell you what you can learn from this. Chapters 22, verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offerings and laid it upon Isaac and his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire, I can see the fire, and I can see the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? You see, this goes back to once more the New Testament. And here it tells us that the Lamb of God is not what is man thought out, is not what is created by a committee. The Lamb of God is what only God the Father can provide. Isaac said, where? Father, where? You've got, you've got all these things ready, but where's the lamb of, where's the lamb that is going to be offered? Abraham said, God will provide. He will provide. Today, our salvation did not come by way of man. Our salvation came not because of our works, not because of who we know here on earth, but our salvation came because God the Father sent His Son to come and seek and save them that are lost like us. God provides. There is no other way, only one way, and that's God's way, and Jesus is the way. He says, as often as you drink of the cup and eat of the bread, you do this proclaiming, proclaiming. You declare, you remind yourself. What do you remind yourself of? The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 11, if God will not withhold his own begotten son, if God will not hold back his only begotten son, will he not gift us everything. This is the covenant promise of God, that when we proclaim, we also proclaim God will provide. Brothers and sisters, we go through stretching times now. We're strained financially, business is slow, we're concerned about our currency, we're concerned about uh, how little there is financially and how long this is going to last. We're concerned about different things that in our lives 
that has to do with provisions. When you break the bread and when you drink of the cup, you must remember that you have become the heirs of Abraham. You are now a part of what God has promised Abraham, that this is in the covenant God will provide. If God would not spare his own son, will he not give us everything God will provide? God wants you to hear this in his house, that whatever you feel, that you're being stretched in and what is lacking in your life, and you feel a financial weakness or you feel weakness in other areas that you don't have a whole lot left, God will provide. God has provided for Pastor Lee Ming and I over the years, 40 over years of serving God. I have seen the goodness of God. I've seen God bless me in the most difficult of times. This time, during the pandemic, during the time of shutdown, during the time of lockdown, during this time where everything is reduced, God has blessed us once more. He has blessed me financially during this time. He has blessed me, He has given me gifts that only God would choose to give me. It's simply the grace of God. I am blessed. God has blessed me not only with finances, God not only has blessed me with material things. God keep blessing me above all these things because all these things will perish. I will go back to the Father without any of these things. But God has blessed me with spiritual riches. Every week, week after week, coming, standing in front of you and bringing revelations from God, I first get it. I get the best. I get the cream from the top before I bring it over to you. I get the experience from God. I get the encounter with the Holy Spirit. I, I keep staying amazed, amazed. I mean, I was so worn out, tired, you know, from the trip, you know, a, 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 just this crash trip of being in East Malaysia and coming back late last night, reach home after 11 from KLIA, and it was, it was difficult. Two nights, one night in Kota Kinabalu and one night in Sarawak, that's, that's fast. And, and there was so much, I mean, from day, from morning, six in the morning, all the way up to night. And I, I mean, I was so exhausted sitting on the plane coming back uh, last night. And, and this morning I woke up and boy, I tell you, God was just kind of like filling me with revelation, giving me this word to bring to you. And of course, it will be impossible for me to finish them all. <laughs> but it is amazing how God... Um, did so much, and, and, and that's what I'm talking about, the spiritual riches that no money can buy, that God will just give it to you and satisfy you and bring a freshness to your being and your spirit. I have been blessed that in this time, God has kept my cup overflowing. And God can do the same thing for you. God can bless you in the same manner but it never starts that way. That until you're ready to lay it down at the altar of God, I tell you, God has a lot for us. Every seed that falls to the ground, if it doesn't fall, it will abide alone. But it falls to the ground and die, it bringeth forth much fruit. It is a kingdom principle. It's a principle in the kingdom of God. If you hold it and keep it, you will lose it. But if you lose it for his sake, you will get much more. Oh, praise God. What do we learn from this? God will provide. So when you take of the bread, you proclaim what? You proclaim that he's your provider. You proclaim that he's the miracle working God. You proclaim that nothing is impossible with God. You proclaim him as the almighty God that whatever might and power that comes against you, that tries to push you back, that tries to floor you, you said, my God is able. Nothing is going to stop what God wants to do. He will see me through these times. He will provide for me. He'll show me the manifestation of His power. He'll show me that the promises of God is yes and amen, and He will stand through to good times, bad times, anytime 
God can do it. He's done it before. He'll do it again. He's a miracle working God. Oh, hallelujah. That's what I did in Saba. I was in Kodakinabalo. I was with different people. I'm not going to name names, mention whoever they are. But that's where we prayed. That's where we stood. I stood with the brethren. And I prayed, God, this is a time not just for Saba, but this is a time for Malaysia. We're connected because we're part of the destiny. God is doing something that man could never do. Only God can do. If you keep waiting for people, they'll disappoint you. If you keep looking to man and trusting what man can do, they will keep disappointing you because you are disappointing yourself. Because only God can go beyond the limits of what is in our times. We are facing roadblocks all the way. Every step of the way, we've got roadblocks. How can you run through all so many and every one of them? You can't. But God comes like the wings of an eagle. And we ride through those times and ride above the storms. Because God is in control. Hallelujah. God will provide we proclaim that God will provide. I want you now to look at verse 9. And he came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar. And then it goes on. We read it all the way down. But let's look. Now it was 12. And he said, lay not your hand upon the land. Neither do you anything to him. Now I know you honor God. I can see that you will not even withhold your son. Why was Abraham so steady? And why was his heart so sturdy about what God commanded him that he make sure that he will fulfill it and obey God all the way? Why? Why was Abraham this way? What was he made of? When we come to the Lord's table, who do we proclaim? And what is it about him that we proclaim? Hebrews chapter 11, let's turn to that. I'm not going to go much further. But we'll go as long as we can. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Let's look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promise, the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall your seed be called. This is everything is put on Isaac. Isaac is the one. He carries the covenant of God. He carries the future of God's people. It is upon Isaac that he carries all the plans of God. He says in verse 19, hear this, accounting that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure or figurative, in a figurative sense. Ah, this is important. How strong is Abraham's faith? How far? Did Abraham trust God or willing to trust him? Abraham was so steady. He was determined to obey God 100%. It was because Abraham had the faith to believe. His faith stood upon knowing who God is and whether his word can be trusted. But I tell you that it's not because he was new to it. He had the experience. He thought Abraham, the Bible here says, Abraham went through some thinking. And Abraham thought to himself, I'm going to do what God tells me. I don't understand everything, especially what he commanded. I, I, I don't understand it. But I will do it because God told me. 
and he was ready to plunge the knife on his only begotten son, Isaac. And he thought, here is the revelation, here is what we have come to understand, his thought process. He went as far as imagining Isaac died because he killed him. And it's because God told him. And because he was willing to obey God than himself. And he see the dead body of his only begotten son. And he thought to himself that God, you're going to raise him up. Even if he had died. Why? Why? Because God raised Abraham up. Abraham was dead. When God gave Abraham the promise, look at the book of Romans. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 4. Ah, look at Romans chapter 4. What does he say here? Chapter 4 was 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, who brought the dead to life, who resurrected the dead, and called those things which, he, which be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. Watch verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. His own body now dead. When he was a hundred, about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Here is two dead bodies. Here is two dead bodies that came alive. Here is these two dead bodies that are so dead. And yet God, when he caused them to come alive, they were able to reproduce and give life. Not only did they receive divine life, but they were able from that life that God resurrected them from the dead, they in turn brought life. How powerful could that be? And Isaac was a product of that. How many times have we died? How many times have you gone through failures? How many times have our economy been hit? How many times have we faced dark periods like this? You've gone through a lot of trials we have. We all have gone through testings and trials. We've gone through times when it's been so difficult, we don't know if we'll make it out of it. We've died before. We've seen God raise us up. We've seen God bring restoration. We've seen God brought us into a new thing. We've seen God do it. Abraham says, I'm part of that. I was a dead man. My wife was dead and we got resurrected. So why not a third time? Why not one more time? Brothers and sisters, why not one more time? One more time, God's going to raise you up. One more time, God's going to restore. One more time, God's going to turn everything around again. One more time. We were given for dead by different people. I've seen it in my lifetime how many times, I don't know. We can go through so many testimonies and stories. How we were gone, how we've lost so much. How, how, I mean, we've gone through those times. Praise God, He's a specialist in raising the dead. <laughs> He's an expert. He knows 
how to go and dig you out of your grave and cause you to walk again and cause you to run and live and jump and praise God that God once more showed up. He'll do it again. When you proclaim at the Holy Communion, when you proclaim that Jesus died, you also proclaim, oh, praise God. It's not the end. It was not the end. It didn't stop there. God the Father sent his power from heaven and shook that grave and up Jesus arose. And that covenant became a part of our lives. Oh, praise God. Two deaths, two resurrections. Unless there is a death, there is no need for resurrection. And until there is a death, then we can pray for resurrection. Hallelujah. We will rise again. I said we will rise again. We will rise again. And we will keep giving life. We will keep bringing blessings. We will keep bringing hope. Oh, praise God. There is a lot of work yet to be done. There is a lot of places yet to be taken. There's a lot of things yet that yet we have not yet seen. There is a lot of victories that has yet to be won. We will rise again. Hallelujah. Believe God, we will rise again. With the setbacks that we've gone through for this period of time, with all the things that we seem to have and then it's taken away from us, with everything that it seems like is going a certain way, suddenly it's all broken, every breach, every road, everything is like it exploded on our faces. We shall rise again. Oh, praise God. Abraham says, why not one more time? Why not, why not one more body? God can raise Isaac up again. We're living testimonies to prove that. You and I, we're living testimonies to prove that. That God can raise us up once more. Oh, praise be to God. I tell you what you need to pay attention to. Back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. What do we proclaim? What do we proclaim? Hallelujah. Was eight. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide. Oh, hallelujah. God will provide. Yes, he will. What do we proclaim in the death of Jesus Christ that brought us into the new covenant? God will provide. Are you ready to proclaim that God always proclaiming that God will provide? Well, in this case, you know, that there is a biblical truth in that, it's a doctrine in that. Because you notice that Abraham answered Isaac, God will provide the lamb. We know the lamb of God. Jesus is the lamb of God. And that's why when God stopped Abraham and says, it's enough, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw a ram that was caught in the thicket, in the bushes. Couldn't go away because his horns was caught. That, that, that chap was so old. That chap was no lamb. It was a ram. It's grown. It's old now. And it's got such a long, big horn until he couldn't get free from being caught in the bushes. Because this is only symbolic, it was not meant to be that way because that's not the lamb. God will provide that lamb. And therefore, Abraham sacrificed a ram because that lamb of God was to be in the coming days. Fulfilled 2,000 years ago when John the Baptist says, Behold the lamb of God that was slain for us. 
Jesus. So when we come to the Lord's table today, what is God saying to us? God will provide. That is the covenant. That's part of the covenant that made us heirs of Abraham. God will provide. And lastly, look at verse 8. Uh, we've seen verse 8, but look at verse 5. Verse 4 says, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, the two that accompanied them to go up to Moriah. You see, by the way, Moriah, Mount Moriah is very significant too. Because not far away from Mount Moriah, it, it's a mountain and a part of that is the peak, uh, the, the places of Moriah. Another part of that mountain is Calvary, Mount Calvary. And Abraham said, God will provide for a lamb. He will provide. And in verse 14, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, his provision shall be seen. In the mountain of God, he says, in this place. God will provide for himself the lamb. And a long time later, to the time of Jesus from Abraham, right on that same mountain, God provided for himself the lamb that was to be slain on that same mountain. God will always be true to his word. God will always keep his promise. God will never break his covenant. If we have, through Jesus Christ, been made an heir as being the seed of Abraham, it remains true. Whether it is good times, prosperous times, pandemic times, hard times, it never changes the word of God. He will do it for us in this time. Where does it lie? By faith. When you proclaim, what do you proclaim? See, we proclaim many things. We rehearse many things. We say things that are repeated from what we hear, and it's always negative, bad news. There's so much out there that is so rotten that tells you that it's end of the road, it's dead, it's impossible. Get out. Forget it. Give up. You won't make it. That's not what we rehearse. That's not what we declare. You proclaim what the death of Jesus has meant for us. That we have now become the heirs of Abraham. That now we are people that are called blessed by God. That we will be blessed to be a blessing. This is the promise. It says in chapter 22, let me read it to you. In verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven the second time and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord. He made an oath. He's never used the word sworn until Genesis 22. It's always been a promise. But now he swears. That promise shifted. Now God has proven Abraham's heart. God has proven that this is true. That it's not just like what everybody says. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. It's not just like how many people pray. For yours is the kingdom. And then we've kept everything else. Yours is the power, and yet we think that our power is of some use, our power is of some good. 
for yours is the glory and yet we take pride of everything and we're so proud that we think that we can do it again we me myself that i i have achieved something and so now i can go out there and try to do it again because i'm that good i'm that great i'm that knowledgeable i'm that experienced i'm that wealthy i'm that powerful that is not just speaking it or, or praying it religiously. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory now and forevermore. No, God says, Abraham, I've tried you and I've known you. That when you pray and when you live your life, when you walk through every situation here on earth, I know that you mean it, that it is God that is sovereign over everything, that it is God, that is His boss. God is whom He obey 100% and submit totally to His will. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Is it for real? Is that what you mean? Do we really mean it when we say that yours is all these things? That you always call the shots big or small? That no matter how difficult it is, I'm, I, I walk away from my rights. I walk away from what I demand that I must have for myself. I walk away from it, even if I have to sacrifice and give up everything. Give up everything that may even be my legacy. I give it up and walk away from it. Are you prepared to do that? And God says, now that I have known you, Abraham, He says, I'll swear to you. It's no longer a promise that doesn't have a time gap, that doesn't know how long, how far, how much. It's just a promise. God says, I'm going to put on that promise a certainty. I swear to you. I vow to you. What an incredible thing. God says, now I know you'll hold nothing back from me. You'll give me everything. So I swear to you. Says God, because you have done this thing and has not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand is upon the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. Verse 18, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. You've obeyed my voice, obedience. Now, verse 19, and I'm going to stop here. So Abraham returned unto the young man, and they rose up and they went together to Bathsheba. And Abraham dwelt at Bathsheba. Oh, that's another truth altogether. Bathsheba is an exciting destination. It's a powerful revelation that God has in Bathsheba for us. So we're going to bring that the next time when we talk again about the Holy Communion. But this is the last thing that I want to put into your spirit. Abraham returned back to the two of them that accompanied him, that went with him. But it's in verse 5. What did he proclaim? What did he proclaim to them? In verse 5, And Abraham said unto the young man, Stay here with the animal, with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder. Me and my son will go beyond this and worship. And then we will come back again to you. What do we proclaim? No matter where you are today, no matter how the waves has pushed you, in your own family life, with all the difficulties that you've gone through and what it cost you, and with the uncertainty that comes with the times that are so unusual for us. You think that you've lost time. You think that you've lost opportunity. You think that you've lost finances. You think that you have lost all kinds of different things that are valuable to you, that are important to you. You think that you have been robbed of progress and promotions. You, you think of so many different things. You think that you've lost your health. Whatever it is that you feel you've lost, 
when Abraham had it sitting heavy on his heart that he's going from here on up to the mountain and God requires his son to be killed. What did he proclaim? Just like he said to Isaac, he doesn't know where it's going to come from, how God is going to do it. He just said to Isaac, God will provide. He said to this man, I shall return. Does he know how he's going to come back? Does he know how he and his lad? Does he know how Isaac and him is going to come back? But all he confessed, he's not going to confess anything less than what he believed, that what he had faith for, that his hope is in God. He says, we shall return. We shall return. And he returned with Isaac. Are you ready? I shall return. Can you say that? Can you say that? Can you start believing God? I shall return. No matter what happens in this country, no matter what happens in our neighborhood, no matter what happens in our city, no matter what happens in our state, no matter what happens in my family, no matter what happens in my job, no matter what happens in my business, I shall return. Believe God for that. Would you stand with me, please? This is what Jesus bought. This is what Jesus bought when he died on the cross. This is what he gave and what was returned back. He gave us a covenant that cannot be broken. He gave us a covenant that he swore to Abraham that he's going to keep. What a great man of faith. What do we stand on when we pray this prayer? What do we stand upon? We stand upon the fact that once spiritually, once we were dead in our sins, He quickened us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. When we were dead in our sins, we were dead. We rose again. He gave us a new life. He's the God of resurrection. You may have faced other kinds of death before, other forms of death that were very real in your life before. He is the God of resurrection. We shall rise again. Don't let anyone or let anything make, bring doubts into your heart. Don't walk by that unbelief or fear in your heart. Let not be any anxieties that grip your heart. We will rise again. And what does it take to rise? Sacrifice. That whatever you can lay at the altar of God, you give it up and you turn away from it and not look at it with lingering eyes and just wishing that you can get to keep something from there to give it up. Surrender it all to God, no matter how much it costs you and no matter how painful it is. Let us sacrifice pave the way for all the blessings of God that will come, for we are the heirs of Abraham. What does it take? Obedience. Not partial obedience, not delayed obedience. You are willing to obey God. You obey God no matter what the command is. You obey God no matter how much courage it takes you to obey. You obey God. Oh, hallelujah. I believe God. I believe God that for every one of you in your own different way and how it applies for each one of you. You proclaim God will provide. And no matter how 
impossible it seems and no matter how dead it is and no matter how far to the end you have reached I shall return lift your hands up to God Father again I thank you that my God your truth is eternal you are the same forevermore and I thank you Lord that as you've spoken to me to all of us this morning I thank you that our hope is in God and God we will continually give you praise and we thank you that you are in control that you sit on the driver's chair and I thank you that God you will lead we will follow you will command we will obey my Lord, shine the light on that path and we will follow. There we will go and where we will walk. I praise you. I thank you that God, we will lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, we will acknowledge you. You shall direct our path. And we praise you, Lord, that we will proclaim life and not death. We will proclaim victory and not defeat we will proclaim joy and celebration and not sorrow and shame my Lord I thank you that we will continually give you praise oh we praise you again and again for my God is able you are the God of resurrection we thank you Lord we shall rise again yet once more for my God will provide and we shall return. Oh, praise God. Your church will return back to the glory and back to the fulfillment of the scriptures as the end time church of Jesus Christ. We will go back to the days as it was in the days of the book of Acts. We will see your glory come down. We will see the divine, divine manifestation of God's power. We will see the glory of God cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Oh, hallelujah. My God is able. Thank you, Lord. The dead doesn't show us the right picture. We see it in your word. The dead shows us the picture that my God is the God of resurrection because in death there is life and there is resurrection. Praise God, praise God for we are the heirs of Abraham. Thank you Jesus for that covenant promise is for us and for our children. Praise God. Thank you Lord, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say, Amen, Amen. amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. We are now going to partake of the Holy Communion. Prepare your hearts. If you're already a Christian, Jesus is in your heart as Savior and Lord. We welcome you to join us to come to the Lord's table and partake of the Holy Communion. But if Jesus is not yet your Lord and Savior, don't wait another moment. If you're watching, you've been hungry, looking for an answer to all the questions in your heart, to all the situations that you are struggling with, God is your answer. And it comes by way of faith in Jesus Christ because it's not anything to do with us. And what you're capable of or what you're not capable of is Jesus that provided it all, that by grace, Jesus becomes your Savior. All you have to do is to ask and Jesus will come into your heart as your Savior. I'm going to ask now and you just take my prayer as your prayer. In the name of Jesus, we stand before you. Oh God, we thank you that you send Jesus as my Savior. I receive him into my heart. Forgive me for all of my sins. Come now into my heart as Savior and Lord. And I pray that you will give me eternal life as you make me a child of God. And I ask that 
you would teach me and show me more of what I need to know and learn about God and your kingdom and about Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. I thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that's it. That's all it takes. And Jesus is your Savior. You become a child of God. But if for some reason, if there is any one of you that have not yet received Jesus, He's not your Savior and Lord, when the trays come, you just let it pass you to the next person and just remain with us. Now let's prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table to honor Him and to remember that He died for us.